Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap. I am really, really excited about this one, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the discussion, you will be able to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience, so if at any time during today's discussion you have a question for any of our panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and, you, and submit your questions, and we'll try to get to as many audience questions as we can before the end of today's webinar. And also at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for two $50 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our two lucky winners. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is State of the CI CD ARA Market, a panel discussion. We have five, count them, five panelists today. So lots of good conversations to be had. Our panelists today are Anders Valgren, who is VP of Technology Strategy at CloudBees. Welcome, Anders. Thanks for joining me today. Great to be here. Awesome, awesome. Then we have Julian Fish, who is Director of Product Management ARO at Microfocus. Julian, thank you for joining me. Welcome. Thanks for having me on today. Great, great. Next, we have Steve Burton, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Harness. Steve, as always, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Shelley. And our next uh, panelist is Reese Arkins, who is Director of Product Management at White Source. Welcome, Reese. Thanks again for joining me. Thank you, Charlene. And finally, today we have Brendan O'Leary, who is Senior Developer Evangelist at GitLab. Welcome, Brendan. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Charlene. Excited to be All here. Right. Great, great. So um, again, the uh, the topic of today's webinar is the state of the CI CD ARA market. And it's based on an ebook that uh, we just produced, and attendees are going to be, excuse me, receiving a link to access the ebook if they have not already. So um, anybody who signed up for today's webinar will get a copy of the ebook. It's also available for download on devops.com. All right, so let's go ahead and dive right on in um, with uh, starting with, I guess, the obvious question, which is, um, you know, the state of the CI, CD, ARA market in general. So um, why don't we kind of level set a little bit? Let's talk about um, really where we're seeing the market today uh, in terms of, you know, different levels of maturity uh, among those organizations who that are uh, adopting CI, CD and, and in the DevOps tool chains. And uh, maybe Julian, maybe you can kind of get us started on um, where you see the market right now and, uh, you know, kind of just to kind of set the stage here. Yeah, thanks, Charlene. I, I guess if we take a look at it in terms of progression over the last maybe five, ten years, we, we've certainly seen a, a big, big uptick. Organizations have gone down the route of continuous integration, um, although it's not prevalent across all areas of all enterprises. And, and again, this is the key thing I think we need to, to think about today. Continuous integration, continuous delivery, application release automation at enterprise level is, is significantly different than, than team-centric adoption. And, and I think what we've seen over the last five, six years is this maturation, this approach that organizations have said, yeah, we've done it at the team level or we're trying it at the team level and we've been successful. How do we now roll that up into enterprise level transformation and, and how do we help the business? And again, I guess that's what we're really targeting is true business transformation. How, how do we make the business more successful <clears throat> through the implementation of the practices of continuous integration, continuous delivery, mm -hmm. appli application release automation? And again, I think the other the other area that we've seen a, a significant sort of change over the last couple of years, as as organisations have adopted these technology approaches, what we've seen is a, a real shift in application architectures that support them. So 
organizations have said, hey, we've been working in a certain way for a long period of time, especially these large organizations, the, the, the financial organizations, the healthcare organizations that have had applications in place for 10, 15, 20 years. And they're using the adoption of CI, CD and ARA as a way to then modernize the technology stacks. And, and they're fitting that under a lot of different banners that could be digital transformation, it could be DevOps transformation. The, the, the big buzzword at the moment seems to be value stream management and, and mm -hmm. transformation through value management. But really these practices at the practitioner level have, have started to get adoption across the board. Um, they're still being undertaken by a lot of organizations. Like, again, don't be afraid if your organization hasn't gone down the, the CICD route at, uh, at enterprise level yet. Um, there's a lot of transformation that needs to take place to support that. But we, we've definitely seen this, this ongoing sort of surge of activity over the last few years as, as organizations have, have really striven to to, to push forward ways to improve working practices. Uh, I guess the, the other guys have probably got some thoughts around this as well. Yeah, so uh, anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, this is Steve. I think mm -hmm. the market's confused. I think, um, I mean, one, one person asked on the, the question, what is ARA? And so if you're not familiar with the market, hearing a lot of these buzzwords makes it kind of difficult to understand. What we've seen in the market is customers are confused between CI, CD. If you ask a customer, do you do CI, CD? They'll generally nod their head and say yes. The vast majority, I think, have spent the last five, 10 years automating builds and tests with CI, and very little has gone into the CD aspect. So um, I think understanding of what is CI, what is CD, and even what is ARA, um, I think there's too many buzzwords and we need to get back to basics and understand um, what these terms mean and, and how we can how we can make it happen in the organizations. Yeah, I would agree I, with I, that uh, quite a bit. You know, I think I think that, you know, getting the buzz out of it is, is really critical. One of the questions I often ask, this is Brendan, by the way, but one of the questions I often ask uh, enterprises is how long would it take you tomorrow for your main one of your main production customer facing applications, if you wanted to ship one line of code to it, how long would that take, right? So the, I think the true power of CI, CD and ARA comes when uh, we can talk about how we're reducing that cycle time uh, over time, right? And actually impacting it. Whereas if we just do a lot of, you know, what we would think of as CI, CD, where we're, we're building automatically, but we don't really create a workflow whereby the organization feels comfortable to ship code quickly into production uh, and do that in a way that's controlled, you know, based on all of our needs for control, mm -hmm. uh, then we're not really focused on the right, the right timeline. All right, anybody else? Yeah, this is honors. I mean, I, I, I pretty much agree with what, what everybody said. I, I think the way I would, and I, I in particular, I agree with with with, uh, with Steve about sort of confusion in the market because uh, I think it's really early days still. I, I think is what that is somewhat of an indicator of. Um, I, I think for all the, you know, kind of talk inside the industry, sort of inside baseball, if if, if you'll forgive the uh, the cultural uh, analogy, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it the the reality is that in in the real world. There's not nearly as much CI and CD happening as as we talk about, um, and and there is a lot of confusion around this. And I and I think, you know, we've definitely made a lot of progress in in the last few years, but but we still have pretty far to go. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we we've done, we spent a lot of time kind of tearing down process and and cultural silos. Um, we still have automation silos. We still have data silos. Um, we we still have a lot of value, I think, to unlock. Uh, in in these in these you know value streams or supply chains, uh, whatever word you want to you want to use for that, and and I think you know one one of the next frontiers is is, is data silos, um, you know un unlocking all of the data that that our various systems are are collecting and, and making sure that they're available, um, mm -hmm. you know sort of in a, in a in a in a in a single source of truth kind of way, uh, so that when we have to answer all the questions that we tend to answer on a daily basis, that it doesn't take us you know three hours of jumping around between different uh, web UIs to try to collect the data that we need. 
um, among among other things. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's, it's it's early days still, and I and I do and I and I absolutely. I mean, I think it's really important too to point out the and as has been done, kind of the difference between what we do for enterprises and and what we do for for teams. Um, the 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 task to tackle in the enterprise context is much more difficult um, and, and much more, um, you know, kind of driven by the reality of what's happening in that organization, you know, with, you know, a, a mixture of technologies all the way, you know, going all the way back to mainframes and all the way forward, you know, mainframes to microservices, as, as, as we say sometimes. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's a tricky, that's a tricky world to live in when you can't just sort of shut down the old technology because it's still, providing value and you haven't figured out, you know, or, or, or had the, the bandwidth to replace that technology yet, assuming if in fact that's even possible. So, so I think it's, 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 it's a different problem space uh, depending on how you look at it. And then obviously if you're looking at a regulated industry as, you know, healthcare, finance, defense, uh, automotive, uh, aerospace, those sorts of things, then, then it's even more difficult still in terms of um, the, the, the requirements and, and the, a little bit the way that, the audit community and the DevOps community have, have learned to work together more productively. Um, I, I think kind of the, that has to happen on a, on a larger scale um, so that so the processes make sense and, and that we're doing all the right things for all the right reasons and not just because we've always done it this way, right? Sort of typical, typical challenge that we have. But, uh, but I, you know, we're making progress, but, but it's early days still in, in, in this market. I mean, you know, a decade of doing something I don't think you really understand the the full impact and the full power and all the ins and outs and, and complexities of, of deploying that kind of worldwide in all industries. I think it's early days still. So do you think that the value of CICD is, is increasing then? I mean, as organizations recognize that um, you know it's integral to, to to DevOps processes and obviously the benefits that DevOps brings. So, so where you know where on that kind of that value curve, if you will, where do you see CI/CD being? I, I think that you know I think it's largely a perception game because I think mm -hmm. that the value of CI/CD hasn't really changed that much. I mean, or the value proposition, I guess uh, we we should say. Um, <laughs> I think you know one thing that's definitely changed, and, and there is more education or self-education happening in the market. Um, the 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 I, I would say the difference is you know nowadays people are confused about what's the difference between CI and CD, what's mm -hmm. ARA. I think if you go back five years, it wasn't what's the difference between CI and CD. It's what is CI and CD. So so there's definitely been a little bit of a change there. But mm -hmm. but I think in in terms of the perception of the value i think what's 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 changing a lot is people are realizing the cost of doing nothing and and the cost of continuing to do what you do today um and and the the competitive disadvantage uh that that can put you in and 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 as well kind of the i mean really just a, a flight of talent disadvantage as well mm -hmm. if you're not keeping up with with you know the better and and newer Hopefully those two things are the same, but not always. Okay. The better and newer ways of, of doing things. Um, so, so I think it's you know the the cost of doing nothing I think is becoming more apparent, um, or, or the cost of kind of waiting uh, to see what shakes out. Um, I think there's a lot of advantages to to being an early mover as as, as long as you're capable uh, of, of of doing that. Uh, but at the same time, there's still a lot of people kind of on the sidelines a little bit trying to figure out how it shakes out um, before they before they commit. Uh, but I think the cost of doing nothing is 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 increasingly apparent, and I think that's really what fuels a little bit of the the perception of the value of CI and CD increasing. I think the value has always been there. It's just a question of mm -hmm. can you achieve. Okay. All right. Better recognizing. All right. Great. Um, any other thoughts before we move on? Yes, Reese. Here, just one thing is that we're seeing the maturity of the the tools in CI and CD also then enable other adjacent industries like ours. So, you know, we we run security tools, and most of the way people run that is on CI CD. Um, and you know, five years ago that would have been a lot harder because of limited mm -hmm. environments. But there's a great maturity there now, including containerization that makes CI CD, uh, at least the CI bit in particular, into like a general purpose compute platform almost. So that itself enables a lot of improved testing, security, and so on. That's a great point. I mean, I, we worked with a customer a few years ago where it, it took them two years to roll out a code scanning tool. Um, oh. And most of that was, was had nothing to do with the tool itself. It was just to do with 
the the effort that it took to incorporate it into their processes and their automations and all that sort of stuff. And that you know that that's something that ought to take no more than you know a day or two, um, not a year or two. Um, so that so that's definitely changing and, and getting better as well. I, I agree with that. That's a great point. Yeah, I, yeah. I also think that. Please go. I was just going to uh, completely agree with everything that uh, the Reese was saying there. I think we've we've seen this um, this this increase in adoption of CI/CD, and and obviously that's driving shift left uh, approaches, and and that shift left from a testing perspective and shift left from a development perspective. The the early identification of risk, the early identification of problem, the embedding of security. Um, White Source is, is one of the organisations that we work very closely with. You know, we have technology plugins, we have our own technology in a similar domain, but that whole Whole notion of not leaving anything to the last minute that could be security scanning penetration scanning performance testing all of that being done as early in the cycle as possible is one of the key advantages of the whole notion of continuous integration and then through into continuous delivery and uh, yeah I just think that that whole notion of being able to shift left as much as possible from a, an application verification perspective aligned with shifting right when it comes to integration with the ITSM operations processes are really really key to driving uh, a huge amount more value through the CI CD space than we've seen, uh, at least yet in a lot of our major customers. I think organizational maturity, this is Steve. I think what we've seen is if IT operations on deployment and CI CD, the value is somewhat limited. And even moving to a pure DevOps model where the DevOps team manages CI CD is, is again, the value is limited because it goes through a set of defined people. As soon as you move to self service and actually give the value to the development teams. I think that's where you start to see the value increase. And so organizational maturity and willing to change, I think like like any tool or any buzzword is the is the limitation. Hmm. Yeah, I would I would take that further even. I, I, I completely agree, but I but I think um, you know giving it just to development teams, I think the more you can give it to all the stakeholders, um, you know, which in most organizations includes you know not just development. Um, it, 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 that it, it, it's even that much more powerful that somebody can, you know, uh, spend five minutes doing something which in the past took them a week or, or two weeks of, of, you know, largely, of course, just waiting around because there isn't actually a lot of work to be done to set these things up. It's just mostly approvals and, and questions and architecture reviews and all that sort of stuff. Um, I, I think all across the stakeholders, the more you can provide self-service uh, for these kinds of things, there's massive amounts of value to be unlocked there as well. Absolutely, and, and that goes even beyond it into the notion of, and it's, it sounds like a horribly antiquated term to use, but the change advisory board notion and, and trying to automate as much of that process as possible. Uh, I think one of the big challenges, again, that a lot of our customers have seen over the last couple of months has been the, the inability to get together as a team to go through a change review process as was traditionally done. And automation through that process has, has been a big, big benefit to them in a way that the technology was there, they weren't aware that they could utilize it, but now they've been forced into that route. It's really simplifying that end-to-end -end flow. And, and ultimately, that's what we're trying to drive, as and as mentioned earlier on, that whole flow from the beginning, the inception of the change, through to the production delivery of the change. And it's key from an organizational perspective to not just track the value, but also to track the ability of the organization to deliver that value through the chain. Yeah, I would add on to that too. Sorry, just to keep going, but you know oh, that, cool. that enabling... That that enabling of that, like you you hit it on, it, Julian. The the you know it, being able to communicate and and manage these changes in an automated fashion, and also enabling uh, the team members to do it asynchronously is really valuable. I think that's something that if we hand these kinds of tools to developers, comes very naturally naturally to them. Right, it's how they work in if they work on open source on the or or in their own projects. Right, they're used to this kind of asynchronous. You know, for instance, code review. Right, code review a, being asynchronous that makes a lot of sense. But when you talk about the change review process that may include other stakeholders, security, uh, maybe you know the product or design folks, uh, having our tooling that's also in their hands, uh, as you were saying, to make sure that they can see the change and review it just as efficiently and asynchronously as a you know the engineering manager does, and enabling that kind of change is the thing that really allows groups to accelerate and also gives them the comfort, right? When they're ta we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about, oh, enterprises have to be change, you know, have to be ready for change. And, that, and while that's true, I think that they can, uh, if, if they go about it the right way, 
actually improve their security, improve the compliance um, by not making it a laborious process that folks have to get through and they find the human ways around, but by making it really just seamlessly integrated into you know, the code review and, and shipment process. Yeah, make, make the right way the easy way and everything gets better. Um, exactly. I, I, I think you know tend, tends to be true, and I, I mean I think this is part of the reason too why 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 value stream um, comes into the discussion and value stream mapping and those sorts of activities because you know and, and especially in a large organization when you're dealing with dozens or hundreds or even thousands of, of applications and services and dozens or hundreds or even thousands of, of teams and, and engineers and, and stakeholders because you, you you have to get a big picture view of kind of your end to end you know you know how the factory works basically before you can start to to kind of globally optimize otherwise you're kind of stuck in this world where everybody looks at their piece of the elephant and does the micro optimization or the local optimization that, that makes sense to them but that optimization may may well be just a giant waste of time because it doesn't move the ball forward um mm -hmm. and and only when you start to get a little bit of a big picture view can you can you start to decide in a resource constrained world where to put your, you know, where to put your money, so to speak, uh, you know, where, which which arrow to put the wood behind to, to make progress on improving things, improving processes, improving uh, quality, improving uh, delivery, all, all of all of those sorts of things. And it, that's when a lot of people, you know, I've, I've witnessed this, and I'm sure we all have, when you're in the room with somebody, an organization doing this kind of activity, the light bulbs that go off of, oh my God, I had no idea we did it that way, or no, I thought we did it that way, or well, we used to do it that way, but for this reason, we don't do it that way here. You know, all of those discussions um, had kind of across uh, across the stakeholders were incredibly valuable uh, from uh, information sharing, problem sharing, solution sharing, uh, all, all of those kinds of things. And, and I, you know, I, again, a lot of value uh, sits there waiting to be unlocked um, uh, if, if, you know, if we can just get the time to, to do those sorts of activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, not to flog a dead horse on this one, um, but uh, you used a great term there. You used a, a fantastic phrase. It was uh, it was all around the, the software factory that's delivering value, and and the reality is that that's how organisations now need to really start thinking about software engineering, software delivery, value delivery for business. As digital transformations come on board, and as you know, IT's gone from the days when I started in this industry of being the, the funny guys in the corner room doing their thing and supporting the business to the real core crux of what drives business value. Organizations need to start thinking about how do we do continuous process improvement? How do we validate this end-to-end -end value stream flow through the, 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 the inception through to the delivery of value from a change perspective? How do we make sure that the software engineering industry is behaving like an automotive car manufacturer? For example, using things like the, the TPS, the type, not the time, no, no, not the, not, not the movie with, uh, with folks uh, filling in their TPS reports, but the Toyota <laughs> production system, the, the no of being able to drive waste out, applying lean practices and processes. And, and it really spans this conversation from CD, CD, CI, CD, ARA up into a much, much bigger transformation process. I'm going to stop at that point because uh, we seem to have talked about this one for quite some time. <laughs> I'll tell you what, <laughs> next time I'll just do one slide. You guys can talk about the whole thing for the whole <laughs> webinar. <laughs> it's great. I love it. I love the conversations. But yeah, we, we do need to, to, to move on. But um, I'll also say that uh, a, a good part of uh, uh, what we what I have in the slide deck we've already touched on so that's that's really great I'm, I'm really glad to see that the conversation is flowing that way but um, you know, one of the things I did want to point out was the ebook is really all about uh, the state of the uh, the CI CD ARA space as it pertains to convergence I mean that's a huge huge element in kind of uh, helping the market along its path to maturation. And Anders, um, I know that uh, you know, acquisitions have, have played a, a large role in kind of helping move the, uh, move the market along. And I know CloudBees has done quite a few acquisitions uh, lately. So I thought maybe you would be the good person to talk to about uh, acquisitions in the CI, CD, ARA space and really kind of how it helps move, move the needle, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think there's there's lots of, you know, in, in any kind of emerging market, and, and this is, you know, at least by my definition, maybe not technical definitions, this is still kind of an emerging market. Um, you know, th there's going to be a lot of players in that market, and there's going to be, you know, waves of consolidation. Um, you know, whether it's whether it's you know two two companies uh, tying their uh, 
you know, tying themselves to their to the same mast to, to see mm -hmm. how well they can together, or whether it's you know very mutually compatible uh, product sets and cultures, and you know deciding to to, to join together, uh, th those sorts of things. I mean, I, I you know I, I I think that's a healthy signal in a way, right? Because it mm -hmm. it, 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 it see it, it it shows that there's exits, uh, and it shows that there are there are paths forward that you know, don't necessarily involve, uh, you know, public markets, which are obviously a very difficult, you know, for, forget the whole pandemic aspect of this, but, right. you know, the public markets are a much more difficult space to be in these days for, for, for smaller companies. Um, and, and the, you know, the, 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 the expense and, and, you know, frankly, the hassle of being a public company is much greater than, than it was, you know, say pre, pre 2000, um, mostly for the better, I should add. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it is also keeping, you know, keeping that path, um, uh, you know, out of, uh, you know, uh, that, that path is no longer available to a lot of organizations. So, so in, in, instead, you're going to see, you know, more consolidation and, and, and those sorts of things, both, you know, in, in the fairly, you know, kind of, I would say, fairly small kinds of ways, and also in some of the more significant ones uh, that, that we're seeing. And, and then, of course, the question becomes, you know, is does two plus two equal four, three or five? Um, you know that that's always the question that you have when when you when you see uh, uh, companies uh, merging together. But uh, it's uh, you know it's it's been an interesting journey for us. You know as as as, uh, as the longtime uh, chief technical officer at Electric Cloud before we uh, joined forces and became part of CloudBees. Um, you know it, it it it's been a it's been a great and very interesting journey for for the last year uh, for us to kind of be able to do uh, things at a little bit more scale. Uh, than we were able to do when we were just electric cloud by ourselves. So, so that mm -hmm. uh, has has been interesting, and I, and I think it's it's you know we're going to see more of it, obviously. And I and I think we'll also you know CloudBees will also kind of focus on you know where can we find interesting fits. You know, Rollout mm -hmm. was was a company that we bought uh, late last year to to for their uh, awesome uh, feature flag uh, product, and and I think feature flagging and 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 a focus on features in general. Is 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 going to be a pretty big thing in, in in the future, and that's obviously coming up on our next slide. Uh, so I'm not going to talk too much about that right now. But I, but I think there's a lot of that that's going to go on uh, as well. And I think future flags are are going to be a big deal going forward, a huge deal, quite frankly. So um, Julian, do you think that um, that the convergence that has happened in the market is has happened at a pace that you know is is I guess acceptable for lack of a better term, or do you think we're, you know, we're seeing kind of slow, uh, a slow convergence in the space? No, I think uh, the the reality is both the uh, the corporate and the technical convergence seems to be happening at a rate which is uh, which is acceptable and, and adoptable by our customer mm -hmm. bases. And um, you know the the challenge that we have, and and again to to Anders' point of this being an emerging market, I, I guess not in a pure analyst sense. Hey, we're in the you know the the peak uh, areas of of product adoption according to you know some of the product waves that we see out there. But the the reality is that you know customers and certainly enterprise organizations can only consume technology at a certain pace and that's due to constraints of existing technologies constraints of education constraints of technical onboarding and and i think that the you know the more flux there is in a market the more change there is and, and certainly you know aggressive change and acquisition change or technology change uh, again going back to, to to a five ten year old conversation if we think about technology integrations everyone was was, was talking about using things like soap for integrations now every application wants to use rest for real-time application and integration structures the, the the reality is that the, the convergence is probably taking places at a rate that the market will adopt and, and is is able to adopt I think you know the the corporate acquisitions will continue um, you know nobody likes to be the the last man standing so to speak when it comes to the the, the sole isolated vendor yes it gives you um, a, an element of um, self-preservation self-control you can you can guide your own destiny but but when everyone else in the marketplace is 5 10 15 times your size it becomes very very difficult yes you can be agile and nimble but but you know then organizations start questioning should we be investing in someone who's so much smaller than their partner so I, I think that 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 level of consolidation will continue I, I think there'll be a continued convergence around both technology and and, and corporate product stacks um, and and I think it's going to continue to drive significant innovation into the domain which is which is really key I think the you know the last few years has seen significant innovation around both CI, CD, and the broader ARA domain. All right. 
Anybody else have a thought there? Okay. No, I guess not. Okay. What about standardization um, among the um, uh, CICD tools out there, ARA tools? Um, do you guys see um, maybe a path to standardization, and is it even feasible? And if so, is it is is it happening at a rate that that you guys think the the market will accept? Yeah, I think yeah. this is Steve. I think yeah. you're starting to see that now. I think uh -huh. the reason why standardization has been an issue is because the barrier to entry for CICD is a shell script. And so a lot of customers have been writing Snowflakes and really because nothing existed to help them do CICD easily. And so build it and script it was generally the, the standard. And, and I know when Harness came to market in 2016, the amount of vendors and, and tools that supported Kubernetes, you could count them on less than on one hand. And, and now you can see that there's lots of standards around Kubernetes deployments and taking it further with service meshes. Um, and you've got different standards. I mean, we, we end up with YAML now as another standard but for defining um, a lot of the pipelines you see. There's this open source that Google's working on as well to create other standards for interoperability across tools. Mm -hmm. um, but, but really, like ARA to me is a dead word. It's, a, it's something that has been used in the past to describe the market five, 10 years ago. And we should stop using the word application because it's about microservices. Like let's start using words that mean something to people. Um, application release automation was, was, is, is, is being done and dusted. So CICD to me is, is where standardization needs to happen. Um, you've got a lot of choice with tooling and frameworks and tools. I think there just needs to be a bit more APIs and integrations in between those tools so customers can pick what they want to use. I don't think one vendor rules them all mm -hmm. um, and customers want choice and dev teams, developers want choice. Sure. Just like, hey, I want to use Datadog, I want to use New Relic, or I want to use Prometheus. It's the same deal in, in CICD. I like the type of standardization, though, that um, you know overcomes the need to reinvent wheels. I, I prefer that over the type that constrains innovation. You know, so you know, good standardization. I'd put in the that's been mentioned to say, you know, the use of YAML configuration files, containerization, Kubernetes. These are good forms that help people get faster than what they need. Um, I think any type of standardization that attempts to have a, uh, a like a low bar for everybody to meet, uh, those I'm not as much of a fan of. Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to standardization, <clears throat> I think standardization and simplicity are rarely used in the same sentence for good reason. <laughs> um, you know, oftentimes when you standardize, what you get is soap, when what you really wanted was rest. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it takes, you know, 20 years for the industry to figure out that, you know, soap wasn't the way, rest is a much better way. So, so I think I'm, I'm always leery of, of the, you know, let's get 15 companies together and have, you know, the largest among them produce a 1500 page document that tells everybody how to do CI and CD using a standard, mm -hmm. you know, API. I, I think those, those efforts are generally always doomed to failure. Um, yeah. I, I think REST is the best standard that we have for interoperability right now. It's not a bad one. It's a very good one. Um, I, I, I think... You know, when it comes to how people interact with the systems, obviously a human doesn't generally use REST to interact with the system. That's where things like YAML and, and, and so on come in. Although honestly, I, I, I don't see, in my programmer's brain, I don't see a big difference between YAML, XML, JSON, yada, 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 because they're all isomorphic, right? Some are more verbose than others, obviously, XML, and I'm, I'm looking at you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, but, it, but, but, you know, that approach of declarative, simple, um, you know, kind of purpose-driven ways of, of, of expressing your intent uh, and then having the system interpret that and kind of do the right thing is, 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 is very interesting. But I mean, I, you know, if, if a bunch of companies get together and say, we're going we're gonna to standardize CI, CD APIs, we would probably, you know, I'm, I'm sure we would join and, and participate, but I, but I would be, uh, count me among the skeptics that those kinds of things mm -hmm. ever work out really well. What, what you need are some innovators who come up with things like REST um, and, and, and that are truly useful, truly universal, um, you know, much, much more 
uh, lightweight and applicable and easy to adopt. And, and aren't they technology so much as they are a way of doing things? Um, so, so I think that's, 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 what, that's what we need to focus on. And I think the, the products and platforms that are open in the sense that they have SDKs, they have APIs to all their functionality. You don't have to use the user interface in order to get stuff done. You can automate mm -hmm. your automation tool. Um, those sorts of tools are, are, are the ones that fit in really well because, and especially in the enterprise, right? Because you're, mm -hmm. you're never coming in with a clean sheet of paper in, in an enterprise. As, 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 as one of my favorite customers has said, my, my junior mainframe engineer is 75 years old. <laughs> it sounds like a joke, but it's it's actually a true statement. It's uh, it's uh, it sounds very familiar. Uh, I think yeah, you've hit on it again. It's, it's one of those things where you know we do, we don't get to let go of technologies. Exactly. I, 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 you know, walk into any fifty-year-old organization, and you will see fifty-year-old technology. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's almost like walk, the only walk, way to, you know, exactly. Walk, walk into a twenty-year-old company, and and you'll see Java everywhere. And and, exactly. and again, you know, how. how you know how modern is that but i guess the the key when it comes to standardization is and again making sure we learn from the past uh, if you think about what happened uh, a while back with itil uh, itil v1 was very very prescriptive around how implementation should be done and it failed miserably in adoption not because it was bad per se but it was so restrictive that organizations didn't feel that they could take 5,000 engineers, 5,000 support staff, 5,000 business users and train them to the prescriptive level of implementation. And what you see now with something like ITIL v4 is a much more flexible framework. And I think that's where the, the CI, CD, and I do think ARA, um, I'm going to be a little bit controversial here and not agree with Brendan and say applications and product centric delivery is key for enterprise organizations. Microservices, yes, it's on the adoption. Yes, it's on the uptake. But no, you can't go into a legacy organization. When I say a legacy, I mean a company that's been around more than 10 years and tell them that they have to microservice all of their applications. It just isn't feasible. But that adoption pattern that we're seeing with standardization around something like a CI, CD approach is key as long as it's flexible. And as long as it's not prescriptive, and I guess to Andrew's point, what tends to happen is you get 10, 15 organizations with 10, 15 thought leaders coming into a, a practice alignment, something like the IEEE standard around DevOps, and they put a very, very blinkered view of this is what we should put in place to make sure that everyone behaves in the same way. And every single organization that I deal with, you guys, it may be different, but every organization that I deal with is different. And they need and have to support different implementation models to support their different business values and different functions. And that's where we need to be very sort of grown up around the thought process of, yes, we can put some standards in place, but no, they can't be very, very prescriptive. Otherwise, it'll end in failure and, and we'll be coming back in 10 years time saying, do you remember when we talked about standardization CICD and it failed miserably? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, like I as, think, a, uh, as a as a I don't want to be too as a company, on, on ITIL, but I think if if uh, you know if 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 our if our if the best thing we can say about ITIL v4 is that it has a hundred pages less than ITIL v3, <laughs> we got more work to do, people. Definitely. Yeah, we we've, we've integrated yeah, with right, over yeah. we've integrated with over probably twenty CI platforms, and I still don't think that well i really wish that you know there'd been a standardization there i i like seeing them mature as quickly as they can and i think that all companies converge on good ideas so in the end you know you see similar models in all of them because you know either they converge on the same good ideas or they yeah. fade away all right grace uh i'm doing a Quick time check here. We're about uh, 22 minutes to the top of the hour. So we're blowing through this, guys. Uh, I'm going to actually skip over the next slide, which was about um, features, which I, um, you know, uh, I think probably it might be a more compelling conversation if we skip over into the security aspect of CICD ARA. And, and I, I, I say that because obviously security is always a, a big topic when we're talking about DevOps in general, but uh, integrating security into the CICD tool chain is uh, very much a, um, a consideration for organizations these days. So, so Reese, I'm going to Turn this over to you, since since your organization uh, is is all about the security. So, you know, what are some of the considerations that organizations need to keep in mind when it comes to CI/CD, ARA, and security? 
Yeah, great. So we touched on a little bit earlier in the intro uh, when there was talk of shift left security. Mm -hmm. um, so continuous integration, continuous deployment are really essential to shift left security. Mm -hmm. And shift left really is that idea that the earlier we can catch security problems, the better off we are. Just that, that simple. Um, so that's the philosophy. What's the practice? Well, the practice is that you want to run security and compliance checks, like things like licenses. You want to run that before you merge code and put it live. Um, and as with many things in life, you know, if you don't have a process or you don't automate it, you forget it. And as the security vendor, I'll, I'll dare to say that I think security is pretty much the number one thing you don't want to forget. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, the automation of security is really like essential to protecting protecting your company, protecting your code. So when a company has continuous integration that runs automatically, uh, that itself is a fantastic platform to integrate security tools with. Um, the other part of where I'd say it's really important, and I think it was Brendan mentioned it earlier, where he said he asked people, um, how long does it take them to deploy um, you know, a line of code? And that's kind of funny because actually, you know, what White Source often does is tell people change this line because you need to upgrade a version of something to resolve a vulnerability. So, you know, if you've paid money to your security vendor and we can say that's the exact line to change, do it now. Um, if it's going to take you days to release that, then, you know, you're kind of like wasting a lot of that value. So it's not just the CI part, but it's also the continuous delivery when, you know, your security vendor tells you the line to change. How quickly can you release that? And to me, it's amazing how many organizations, and, I, and I've asked a very similar question over the years, you know, it's kind of the, it's the eve of the release. You have a, an absolute showstopper bug. It's a one line fix. You go fix it. How long before you're back to where you were the moment before you discovered that bug? That's kind of the way I, I ask that question. And to me, the amazing thing is not that people say, oh, this many hours or this many days or this many weeks. The amazing thing is the quantity of organizations that just don't have a known answer to that question. They don't know. Um, you yeah, know, it, there can be a lot of manual process. It's, it's not knowing that to me is a little bit scary. It really is. And I think right to Reese's point, and and kind of combining that with what you were saying, Anders, is you know bringing security into the discussion before the eve of the release is really critical. So uh, before I came to GitLab, I worked uh, in a government contractor, uh, and I, I remember we would get to the end of a release cycle, like an eight-week um, product increment or project increment, and that's when they'd say, "Oh, okay, well now we should give it to security to run the scans." And you come back with 175. Uh, positive results and then you have to make this horrible decision between do you ship that uh, to the people who need it right this is for the department of defense so critical uh, folks on the other end of the software or do you and and take the risk of those 175 things you now know about uh, or do you fix them and, and delay the release you know the better way to do is to do neither of those things by having a tool that integrates directly into your ci cd so that each one of those 175 things were choices that were made along the line uh, where the developer has the full context from the security tools that you have to understand the impact of the change you're making. And you can make the smart decision then to either not introduce that or say, oh, no, this is a false positive there or say, oh, well, yes, but we're going to accept this risk because it's mitigated in this other way. Making that choice on a one-off basis is, is relatively simple to do. When you get 175 of them at the end of a eight-week sprint, uh, you basically have to make the choice to to ignore them or to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of the the traps that we fall into with security are are really just the same old quality traps, and and it, it is a different discipline. But to me, quality and security are are, are really just two sides of the same coin, uh, because the, the the processes and 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 habits uh, that you use uh, to ensure quality or or ensure a known amount of quality at the end are very similar if not nearly identical to what you do around around security um they lend themselves to more automation i think which is which is the good news yeah. um but, I, I but, think but the thing is for too long and still we're kind of in this mode where it's almost like we treat it like we're in a restaurant and security is something that we sprinkle on the dish the moment before we hand it to the customer to eat and and it, it doesn't work that way you know it's not quality and security are not something you sprinkle over the food you know mm -hmm. the second before you eat it. it it's something that you bake in it's an ingredient um, and if you exactly. don't treat uh, security and quality as a first class feature, 
you will not have security and you will not have quality because hope is not a strategy. Hoping <laughs> that we're going to be secure is not a strategy. Hoping that we're going to have quality is not a strategy. You need to ensure, you need to have processes, you need to start early and do it frequently to, to do that. And, and I think a lot of the industry, we're still kind of in that mode of, yeah, you know, we'll give it to the security people and they'll, you know, do whatever weird black magic they do and secure it. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, I mean, we sometimes yeah, even double bake it. Oh, sorry, uh, just quicker. We sometimes double bake it, you know, so you can scan the source code repository, uh, you know, with with continuous integration, and then you potentially can also scan uh, the Docker image once it's been uh, released to the registry as well. So, you know, like you said, not just sprinkling at the end, but like multiple stages throughout the process, just trying to catch anything before it's too late. Yep. Matt, I yeah, said exactly. The exactly. What I was, uh, was going to comment on recently. I was just—I was just going to say exactly the same. I mean, this this whole notion of of, of embedding CI, CD, and, and security scanning is, is is great to a point for some of our organisations. And and whilst we always look to embed as much security scan through the CI process and then the CD process as possible, that there, there obviously comes a time where the the impact of security scan, i.e., the timeline that it takes to run the security scan, may start negatively impacting your CI build type pipelines. And then uh, there's an area that we didn't talk about, uh, which was around sort of technology strategies and features and, and some of the areas that Anders mentioned earlier on about feature flagging. The whole feature flag notion can be used in conjunction with security scans. So you can be doing your uh, CI CD and your, uh, your, your, your static analysis scans or your code analysis scans as part of your application CI build, and then have a separate feature flag build with similar content or the same content, almost like a, a, a traditional all-world integration notion, but running security against that in parallel because you need to take that load from security off your CI CD servers. So there's, there's this parallel action, and, and again, Reese sort of mentioned it, being able to, to scan the CI process, being able to scan the container. In parallel to that, again, based upon the size of your application, maybe even scanning the application through dynamic scanning, through um, static scanning in parallel, because you're trying to make sure that none of this big lump at the end, those 172 different changes that need to be verified at the end of the process doesn't happen. So, so just ways of implementing and blending in that security scan through the process. I, I think there's a really important point in, in, in that statement, which is if you only have one pipeline, one software pipeline for your product, you're probably not doing CI CD properly, right? Mm -hmm. Because if, if you have a CI pipeline that does all the tests, in our case for, for the flow product, we run several hundred thousand tests when we yep. do a full production build for release. That takes 24 hours. We mm -hmm. obviously don't have 24 hour cycles for our CI. So you have to have a pipeline for CI. You have to have a pipeline for more, you know, lengthy integration testing, SOAP testing, pen testing, you know, whatever, whatever you know, all these sort of lengthy processes are. So I, one of the questions I ask nowadays is how many pipelines do you have for this product? And if the answer is one, then we've got work to do. Hmm. Okay. Well, we're about 13 minutes to the top of the hour, so um, I want to go ahead and move along here and just because, uh, you know, obviously we could talk security all day long, but let's let's go ahead and close things out. Um, any final thoughts that, that we, um, you know, that, that we need to go over in today's webinar before we get into the question and answer period? And I just kind of open this up to any one of you to start. I guess just a, a quick statement of if you're not currently looking or doing performing CI CD and looking at ARA, definitely start heading in that direction, take it in bite sized chunks, don't try to roll it out across all of your applications at the same time. Pick the teams that are being successful with their approaches and, and try to replicate and improve those and, and take this notion of continuous process improvement across your product delivery cycle. And if that's through the management of ideas coming in, the software development build process, the deployment process, the release governance process, if that's the, the operations monitoring process, look to optimize all of those different areas and don't think of CI, CD as an individual area. Think of it as part of your end-to-end -end ecosystem and, and, and then you'll see way, way more value and way, way more success than, than if you just focus on individual build actions and, and, and steps. This is Steve. I, I would get a pen and paper and I'd actually draw what happens when you create a new artifact. So let's imagine you do a new build. I would actually draw the people involved, the tools, the processes, the time, yeah. until that artifact gets the customers in production. 
and just discover what the existing process looks like and then take baby steps to automate each of those individual processes so you can eventually get to a point where you can push a button and it can deploy in production in under an hour. So I would st start small, go and do a bit of discovery and, and see what you can get to. Yeah, I, I have a very similar <clears throat> kind of thing that I talk to people about, which is imagine you could put a GoPro camera on the head of your source code uh, and follow the source code all the way through to when it's in production and beyond. Um, you have to be able to understand and visualize that entire process so that you can control it and you can you can improve it. And, and that's something that you know I think I think we all need to do to 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 a greater degree than than we do now. I, I think one thing in terms of kind of look ahead, I, I think what we're going to see in the future is we're going to see more of a focus on features. Um, you know, with apologies to the movie The Graduate, you know, the future is features, not plastics. Um, you know, we we we've over the last 20, 30, 40 years. You know, we, we used to spend a lot of time in the old sort of waterfall days on this notion of a release. You know, every 12 months or 18 months, we pop out a new release. Um, releases are too big, they're huge batches, you know, they have a lot of issues. What we want to get to is kind of, you know, and, and where we got to over the last few years was we think more in terms of continuous, continuous integration, continuous testing, continuous, continuous, continuous. Um, the, 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 the problem there is we start to look a little bit at something which is too small, which is mm -hmm. a build. You know, we've gotten very build focused, and, and obviously, you know, we're we're the Jenkins company, so mea culpa. Um, but but we focus very much on that. So it's kind of a Goldilocks situation where we've got these huge things called releases on one end, and on the end, other end of the spectrum, we have these tiny little insignificant things called builds. What we really want is the thing that's in the middle that's just right, and that's features, because mm -hmm. that's what we care about. That's what our customers care about. That is the quanta of value. That we deliver to our customers is a feature you know whether that's a bug fix or a security fix or a, a totally new feature where you can do something you couldn't do before that is the thing that we care about and that's what we want to track and should be tracking um so yeah i'm, I'm totally throwing my uh, my focus on features uh wrapping you know, <laughs> just because i wanted to get it in but uh, it, it it really is you know once we can think about that and, and say look i don't care about a build I don't care about a release. What I care about is what is this feature? Where is it in the pipeline? What's blocking its release to customers so that we can, you know, get their money, their value, their respect, their love, whatever it is that we're trying to get, uh, you know, whatever our business model is. Um, that really is what we want to be focusing on because that's what the customers care about. Customers don't care about releases. You know, what, what, they, what I care about when I get a new release of an app is, have you fixed the bug I care about? Have you mm -hmm. added the feature that I want? I don't care what the release number is. I don't care how many builds it took you to get there any of those things. I care about the feature. And I think what's really exciting is we're starting to see now, and of course, we're, you know, we're working on this in, in our products uh, at CloudBees, obviously, but, but is this kind of renewed focus on the notion that features are the thing that we care about. And that's the right unit to, to think about, much more so than builds or releases. Well, next time we'll do a 90-minute webinar, we'll have a half an hour on features. <laughs> How does that sound? <laughs> Sorry, no. we just ran out of time, unfortunately. Features, I, I uh, features are are definitely an important aspect, and 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 uh, you know I wish we had time to really discuss features uh, in greater length, but uh, read about do, it in the ebook. And yeah. there you go, there you go. You can read about it in the ebook. But I did want to give us uh, just a, at least a few minutes to go over a couple of the audience questions because we've gotten some good ones in, and I want to make sure that we're able to get to them. Um, okay, we do have one question that um, it's it's a I think is an important one. I, I would already define CD as covering application release automation. So why do we have a new additional term, ARA? So I, I mean, so there's a lot of history around this, obviously, but but part of it, part of it, I'm I'm going to sort of throw the analysts under the bus um, because they're <laughs> they're they're you know they, they seem to be the ones that always want to coin new terms so that they can release new reports. I love all of you, all my analyst <laughs> friends. I love you. Um, but you know, every once in a while, they decide, oh, we're not going to call it ARA, or we're going to call it ARO, or we're going to call it this or that or the other. It, it, I'm sort of, my personal definition is, I think a lot of this falls under the umbrella of continuous delivery. Continuous delivery is the state we're trying to achieve, where in as rapid a fashion as possible, when we complete something in the source code, that we can have it in front of customers as quickly as possible. To me, that is the overarching problem that we're trying to solve for. Whether we want to have whether we want to segment that into 
you know, CI on one end and, and continuous deployment on the other with continuous delivery being overarching, or whether we want to call it application release, you know, automation or application release orchestration. I think those are semantics. I think mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is get to the point where we can release software when the business wants it more reliably, more repeatably, more predictably. That's the problem we're trying to solve. We can all come up with different names for that. That's the problem we're trying to address. And to me, it all comes down to that. Any other thoughts of anyone regarding that? Okay, all right, great. We're just too afraid of uh, upsetting our analyst friend. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. All right. <laughs> okay, so real quick then, one more question. Um, okay, here's a here's a statement. Just a thought on security automation. Uh, SAST and IAST automation are not just the answer. You also need to train DevOps teams in security as well. Else you are dependent on the security teams to create and analyze the security suites. You have only talked about security automation. DevSecOps needs automation and embedding security expertise into your DevOps teams as well, at least in my humble opinion. Any thoughts on that on that uh, statement? Yeah, I, I, think, I agree. I, I think it's I a good question. I completely agree, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I, I, was, I was reading it just before, so I'm glad you picked it. Um, I, I'll give an analogy, maybe a relevant one for right now. Um, so what it means is that it's not just about uh, training people to understand security reports, but it's also about making security reports, reports understandable to the mm. audience who needs them. Yeah. So we bring them to the uh, to the developers and DevOps teams, but they have to be understandable, they have to be actionable. Um, by, by bringing that security automation in, what we're trying to do is say, don't make security a silo, don't make security knowledge like, you know, some kind of like secret where at the very end of the project, someone says, hmm, pity. Uh, you did this. Uh, I mean, we need to give that information to the people who need it, which is the mm -hmm. people in the DevOps teams. So, oh, sorry, I was going to say the analogy. Sorry. I mean, so if you if you've been to a hospital, hopefully not lately. Um, sometimes you might be surprised at like how much you know people who are not the official doctor can do. You know, reading of, of X-rays and scans and things like that. And that's because they have been made. There's a moderate amount of training, but it's also about that the reports have been made. Uh, understandable and actionable to the people who will be who will be reading them. I think it's similar with security. Like we're not trying to make everybody a security expert, just like we're not trying to make everybody a doctor. Uh, mm -hmm. We're trying to make uh, you know something in the middle where it's understandable um, to the people who you know are ready and available to take action on them. And, and I think too, keep in mind, and, and I'm not at all saying you, you didn't you implied this, but the, the need to stop the security scans doesn't cease when you go into production. Um, a lot of vulnerabilities are, are discovered, you know, after you go into production. So, um, you know, at, at that point, it's more the ops than the dev side of, 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 uh, of the equation. But, uh, uh, you know, all, all the source scanning and all the artifact scanning uh, a priori, you know, before a release goes out is, is awesome and, and, and wonderful. But you got to keep doing it after you're in production as well uh, so that you know what you have in production that's, uh, that's vulnerable and may need, to, may need to generate a release in order to, to fix that or, or generate a patch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The reality mm -hmm. is the majority of vulnerabilities that we catch are in code that's already in production, and that's because that's the vulnerability was only just found. Mm. Exactly. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think uh, I think if you just finalize that one, it, you know, it, it, security is just like quality. It, it is everyone's responsibility. Um, but then to paraphrase something else, um, some people are more responsible than others. Uh, I think that's <laughs> the reality of the situation. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, we're, we're two minutes to the top of the hour, so unfortunately that's all the time that we have for questions, but I do want to um, thank everybody for, for sending in questions, and please know that uh, if we didn't get to your question today, which is probably likely, um, we are all of our panelists are getting a copy of today's question, so um, they'll, I'm sure, be more than happy to follow up with you offline. Before we uh, close things out, I did want to do that drawing for the two uh, $50 Amazon gift cards, lest you think I forgot to do that. So without further ado, uh, today's winners are uh, Shane M. Congratulations, Shane. And our second winner is Jeremy P. Congratulations, Jeremy. We'll follow up with you guys offline uh, via email to make sure that you get your gift cards in a very timely manner. So.
Um, also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, or if you just want to listen to it again, you will have the opportunity to do so. We are going to be sending out an email probably in about an hour or so that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to live on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go find it there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Gentlemen, thank you for such a great conversation. I, I We really should have had at least an, another half hour to go through everything uh, in all seriousness. There's so many topics um, regarding CICD, ARA, we just didn't have time. But thank you so much for, the, for your input, for your insight. Much appreciated by myself and the audience, I'm sure. Also want Thanks, to thank Charlie. the also want to thank the audience uh, for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe.